Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really amazing guest today uh, who is focused on creating a better tomorrow on many unique fronts. Uh, we have the honor of being joined today by Dr. Morva Ja, who is Associate Professor of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he's the holder of the uh, Ms. Parley Dashiell Henderson Centennial Fellowship in Engineering. Uh, Dr. also serves as Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder, uh, along with uh, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak of Privateer, which is a, a space tech venture with a mission of driving space sustainability and creating solutions uh, to make orbits around Earth safe and reliable. Uh, with his PhD, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, Dr. Jaw is the Director for uh, Computational Astronautical Sciences and Technologies, a group within the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences, where his team focuses broadly on the themes of orbital mechanics, uh, including space object detection, tracking, identification, and characterization, as well as spacecraft navigation. He's also the lead for the Space Security and Safety Program uh, at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Uh, Dr. Jock came to UT Austin by way of the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory prior to that, uh, where he was a spacecraft navigator on a handful of Mars missions. Uh, Dr. Jock is a fellow of multiple organizations, including TED, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Aero, uh, Arid Astronautics, the American Astronautical Society, uh, Air Force Research Laboratory, Laboratory. He has served uh, as a U.S. delegation to the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, as an elected academician of the International Academy of Astronautics, and has testified uh, before Congress on his work as a space situational awareness and space traffic management expert. A lot of very exciting things to talk about uh, with him today, but uh, Dr. Morbaja, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us. Hey, I'm uh, very honored, and it's my pleasure to be here, brother. It's really great to have you, and you know I've, I've enjoyed watching uh, presentations that you, you've given in the past, uh, sort of highlighting a little bit of that early journey uh, from San Francisco to, to military high school in Venezuela to guarding nuclear weapons in Montana. Talk, talk just for the sake of this audience, uh, take a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about uh, those early days, if you would, and some of those first instances that got you uh, interested on everything that was flying over our heads at really fast speeds, if you would. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll say this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm first generation, um, you know, American, father from Sierra Leone, mom from Haiti. Um, things didn't work out so well for them. And uh, basically at the age of seven, um, I relocated with my mom to Venezuela um, and uh, pretty much was, was raised in Caracas. Um, went to a military school for uh, a boarding school because, uh, you know, my mom remarried uh, this guy from Venezuela. My stepfather and I didn't quite uh, get along so well. So the, the military boarding school was was part of an outcome of that. But yeah, I mean, um, it you know, going going to this boarding school definitely um, did many things. Not the least of which um, got me into a mode of um, very much wanting to be of service uh, to others and. Um, when I, when I graduated from military school, I came back to the United States, enlisted in the U.S. Air Force, where I was, like you said, I was a security guard at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. And having grown up in Caracas, um, Caracas is, has many, many millions of people, lots of city lights. So on a good night, you might see the moon and, and, and a star or two, not much else. But uh, when I went to Montana, 
it was the first time I was exposed to a really dark sky. And when I had that experience, um, I realized how unempty space is. And, and that was life changing for me. And uh, I did notice some dots of light going across the sky that weren't planes or meteors. And sometimes the dots of light would disappear in the middle of the sky, which made me think, uh, wow, am I losing it? And uh, is this some message from God? Is, are these UFOs or something? Um, two interesting hypotheses, uh, but the one that um, really satisfied the evidence was, you know, human-made objects orbiting the Earth, reflecting sunlight, and when they disappeared, it's because they were going through Earth's shadow and were being eclipsed. And to me, that was like uh, fascinating, and I wanted to know more about that. So uh, at the end of my enlistment, I decided to study aerospace engineering, give that a go, and try to focus on understanding stuff in space and so the science that studies you know why and how things move in space is called astrodynamics mm -hmm. and that's what i decided to focus on and you know I, i've seen in um in articles that uh, have been that you've written have been written about you as well you know i, I was checking out the um uh you recently gave a statement to the uh, the committee on science based and technology uh, subcommittee on space and aeronautics uh talking broadly about what you term wicked space problems and i have heard that people talk about uh, wicked problems in the past on the show in terms of things like climate change and education policy um say a few words about what because you know for for people that aren't in the area of astrodynamics and astronautics it, it all seems pretty wicked <laughs> whether it's the moon or Mars or wherever we're going out there. Um, talk about sort of what makes up the basket and what exactly wicked space problems are to you, if you would. Yeah, so um, basically, you know, we don't, so first of all, I'm not somebody who believes in randomness, really. Um, I, I don't think uh, randomness is really a thing. I think everything is deterministic, but we're just ignorant of all the processes that lead to outcomes. And um, along with the lack of randomness, I can say that where we launch satellites is also not random. So, so basically, we launch satellites into very specific orbital highways, as I like to call them. Um, and, um, you know, we started launching these things in 1957. Now we are tracking about 50,000 human-made objects ranging in size from cell phone to the space station. It's like, where did this stuff come from? Well... You know, uh, as opposed to highways on Earth where when you run out of gas, your car stops eventually, most stuff up there on those highways, when they run out of gas, uh, analogously, they stop working, they keep on going at these high speeds, and many of them are in sufficiently high orbits where uh, it takes a really, really long time, centuries to come back, or just, they never will. And we just, uh, our solution is to just put more stuff up there, and every once in a while, two of these things will collide and become smaller pieces. Um, sometimes they blow up and become smaller pieces. Sometimes people intentionally blow them up and they become smaller pieces. But basically everything from shards of satellites to rocket bodies, to broken solar panels, to fully intact dead satellites, all these things make up this population of uh, you know, human made or anthropogenic uh, you know, space objects. And so getting to this idea of the wicked space problem is that, uh, even though all of outer space may be infinite, near Earth space where we, where we put these satellites uh, is finite and it should be considered an additional ecosystem to, you know, just like land, air, ocean, it, there should be an and space. Uh, it's in need of, because of the finite resource, it's not being uh, jointly or holistically managed, meaning the people that participate in this environment do so without the planning and coordination with other people. Um, and there's less and less of space because more and more people are launching things and there's more uh, debris being um, generated. And our critical infrastructure is moving to being very uniquely space-based. So, you know, internet, uh, climate change monitoring, financial transaction type stuff, position navigation and timing, all these things are served to us through space-based platforms. Uh, and not a single one of those is guaranteed to be shielded from the harm of getting hit by a piece of debris and that sort of thing. So 
this all has, and, and near Earth space is also a complex system in that we don't fully understand all the interdependencies of how things work in, in near Earth outer space. We don't fully understand all the effects and impacts of the space environment on how space objects behave. Um, small causes can have huge consequences. So yep. that's like nonlinear causality kind of stuff. Um, and the emergent behavior that we observe is not explained by adding individual behaviors of stuff that we observe. So all that stuff makes it into a complex system. And it's a wicked problem in the sense that um, there are dire societal issues if we don't get this right. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we're headed towards a, a certain tragedy of the commons uh, if we don't change our behavior. And I guess for people out there, just the, 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 the you know, executive summary on tragedy of the commons is, uh, when you have a finite resource, and in, in the example, uh, I guess this, this, this Lloyd person came up with it, but in this example, it's like if we have a, a plot of land, finite plot of land, and we each bring cattle uh, to this plot of land, if people bring as much cattle as they want, but there's no coordination, uh, eventually all of us lose out because the cattle graze everything, there's no more food. Basically, the carrying capacity of that land gets exceeded much like the carrying capacity of that land would get exceeded and then everybody loses, orbital highways have a finite carrying capacity as well. And, it, and we're, we're headed towards saturation uh, of orbital carrying capacity writ large, and then space becomes unusable. And mm -hmm. then all, all, all these services and capabilities that we depend on stop working. Um, that would be a bad day for humanity for uh, a long list of reasons. And so, that is the wicked space problem that I allude to. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and you've put together this, um, this fascinating uh, digital twin tool called Astriograph. And you, know, you were mentioning those 50,000 pieces of uh, human-made space debris that, that you're currently tracking. I went into this and, and it just, it's really amazing because, and, and there's, so this other level that you've written about, sort of the, the micrometeoroids, I think the number goes something to like a million things are flying around up there, some going faster than bullets or several times faster than bullets. And, you know, in the tool, the astrograph, you've outlined uh, active satellites, about 1,500 or so, then inactive rocket bodies, debris, and then this uncategorized space. Um, more about how is all, who puts all that information in there? Do you have a team that sort of scans the skies and sees these, especially the micrometeoroids? I don't know, ultimately, if things are, you know, the size of a softball or smaller. How do we find them? Who catalogs them all? Um, because when I look at the astrograph tool, it's like, wow, it doesn't look there's much room for anything up there right now. But please take us a yeah. little bit on that. Yeah, so... Um so a couple of things. One, um, so astrograph, right? It's 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 a knowledge graph uh, database for all the you know these multiple sources of information to to, to curate these things. And when you go to the website, you kind of just get the the orbital visual uh, of of the locations of these things. I'll caveat this with saying that the dots are just locations of things. Clearly, not this the size of the dot sure. it has nothing to do with the size of the object. The smallest thing in astrograph is probably the size of the cell phone. So we're not getting to things smaller than that currently. And, um, you know, because this is all about a digital infrastructure, um, the way in which, so there is a, a small team that works on some of these things periodically, but basically the grabbing of data and sources of information and ingesting and curing it in uh, astrograph is automated at this point. So there's no human in the loop every night uh, you know, there, there are algorithms that go out to, to whatever's out there, different uh, repositories, bring uh, data and information into this landing zone at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, then other algorithms recognize that there's something new that has not been ingested into uh, astrograph yet. And we have labeled schema uh, basically the, the nodes the nodes in the graph are entities and the edges or lines or relationships. And so we've laid this out kind of in an ontology kind of sense, just basically a description of the domain. And so we can, we have interpreters that then uh, for each source of information that we bring in, we develop an interpreter to understand what to bring in from that specific source that, that then gets mapped into this graph database, which uses Neo4j uh, software uh, specifically for the graph, for the knowledge graph, for astrograph. And then, yeah, basically astrograph 
uh, is like entropy in the universe. It's always increasing. We never overwrite anything. We just keep on adding more and more stuff because we never know what kind of questions we might want to ask in the future. So, so we never get rid of data or information. We just keep on adding and curating and keeping the information provenance um, so that there can be an application layer on the top end that doesn't have to deal with the raw sources. It can just run queries of this aggregated curated data set to mm -hmm. address a very specific inquiry, everything from uh, can you comment about possible collisions of stuff to uh, can you comment about who is compliant or non-compliant with different laws, rules, and regulations. And so it allows that kind of wide inquiry. Now, Astrograph itself is at UT is on the researchy side of things. So it's not this, uh, you know, operational productized kind of thing. It's more demonstrative to mm -hmm. raise awareness. But then Astrograph has been successfully, I guess, uh, productized in Wayfinder for Privateer. And okay. so Astro Astro so, so yeah, the, the, pro, the commercial version of Astrograph is what's run, running underneath Wayfinder. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and, and before we get into, into what Privateer is doing, you know, I, I, again, I looked at several of your papers and you know, uh, titles like Orbit Determination from Recurrent Neural Network Modeling of Simulated Optical Measurements, Robust Computer Vision Algorithms from Geo-Object Detection, and then a lot of papers in there with optics and lasers and all of the cool things. Talk about the... Um, you know, a little bit, because obviously these are all sort of the bleeding edge tools for understanding, okay, where all that stuff yeah, is yeah. headed tomorrow and the next yeah. day. Talk a little about some of these tools that are used to really yeah. understand and quench this data. Well, so I think, I think um, I'm think i very philosophical about how I, how I approach problem solving in, in this domain. And um, yeah, so I'm going to take, take the, the liberty to just kind of lay the philosophy out there. And so all the tools really map into this philosophy. And the philosophy is as follows. Um, there are events and processes happening uh, specifically in near Earth space that we're interested in. Um, if you want to know something, you have to measure it, you know, measure it. So measurements are the key. And so given these events and processes, um, what's, what, what sources of information are observing these things? And um, given, given the measurements, the output from the measurements are then data. Um, the data, if we observe what comes out of, out of the, you know, uh, the data over time, space, these sorts of things, we see that there's a structure, there's, there's an underlying structure to the data, meaning the data are not just random. There's, there's some pattern in the data. These patterns in the data allow us to then uh, use abductive inference and hypothesize an explanation to the evidence. We can say, hey, here's all this evidence. We see patterns, some structure in the evidence. What are the things that, what are the possibilities? What are the things that could explain the evidence? Even if the possibilities are very different from each other, but I want to enumerate all the things that could explain the evidence. That ensemble of possibilities or hypotheses now represents my total knowledge or ignorance about what's going on. Um, and then what I do is I use, uh, you know, the Karl Popper's falsifiability principle to say, the next time I get evidence, I'm going to ask each one of my hypotheses to predict, uh, you know, what the evidence is going to be. And oh, by the way, does new evidence make any one of these hypotheses now impossible? Does it rule it out? Does evidence discard any of these as being possible? And the answer is yes, remove it. But the, remain, the remaining ones provide an opinion on what they believe the evidence should be. And then the statistical difference between the actual evidence and the opinion now constitutes what I call statistical surprisal. So the thing is, if, you, if any given hypothesis predicts the observation exactly, there's nothing to learn. There's no surprise. It's a boring universe because you already know it. Yeah. Kind of thing, right. And so... Uh, basically, I can start ranking, uh, you know, which ones I believe may be more or less likely, depending on how unsurprised or surprised these things might be. And I just kind of keep that ad nauseum. So, so that's the, the process of things are happening. We want to know about them. We do some measurements. We can't measure everything. So we use statistical inference. The, the measurements yield data. The data follow distributions or have structure. From that, we can create models. The models permit prediction. 
and the difference between the prediction and the observations is surprise. And surprise is an opportunity to learn. And that is now this recursive sort of thing. And so then the question with all the tools that you just explained is, how can I take the best of math, physics, and, 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 and data science and all that to incorporate that around that philosophy that I just described? Excellent. And moving, I know moving, that was long-winded, but you know, no, 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 it was it, it was spot on, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate the you know coming from the 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 philosophical component um, and looking at it from that level. Um, privateer, you know, recently set up. You're going to be incorporating you know everything you've been developing with Astrograph now to as, as you know, sort of the mission of the company working to keep space safe and accessible to all. What is, you know, you know, obviously I think of, all right, we, we all know about sort of airline traffic control and sort of the things that <laughs> go on there, but what, what is the sort of the future of, of space traffic control look like in terms of the use of tools like Astrograph and other things that you may be developing, you know, whether we're five or 10 or how many years yeah. in the future where SpaceX is sending up 50, 100 rockets a day to the, 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 yeah. the space hotels and all that. Walk us through yeah. a little bit what you think there. Well, so so one of the things that I want to just um, step back a little bit on is just to say that um, the 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 core belief uh, for Privateer is the belief that all things are interconnected and that stewardship is the key to solving these problems. Um, so that's like the foundation. And then, given that, um, one of the one of the things that we believe is the hardest challenge to solving these things is uh, lack of empathy and compassion towards solving problems. Okay. And part of that is because people see themselves as independent from the problem. And it's very easy to say, that's not my problem. That's somebody else's problem. The stuff that's happening in space, not my thing. The thing that's happening in you know Ukraine, not my stuff. Like I'm here in the United States, that's another part of the world. So what we wanna do is with Privateer, we want to be a platform company that gives humanity evidence of this interconnectedness and through that evidence of interconnectedness, uh, motivate humans to be more reluctant to say that's not my problem because we will provide an evidence that looks further, deeper, longer, that shows at the end of the day, even if you're in your lifetime, you can escape the effect, your children's children don't escape it kind of thing. So, so we want to provide that evidence. And as a platform, imagine that Privateer is analogous to like the iPhone. The iPhone has apps that come with it. One of our apps is things like collision avoidance. We can have another app that is like, you know, monitoring compliance for rules in space. But really what we're interested in, just like the iPhone has Safari and Mail and that sort of stuff, other people like Outlook, they like Chrome, they like other things. What we want to do is this. We believe the best ideas to solve these wicked problems are out spread across humanity. And the barrier to getting these solutions is an absence of readily available data and information to smart minds. And so as a platform company, we want to say there is a and almost of, of clearly not infinite, but a very large pool of potential developers that if they just had the right tools and access to data and information, they could come up with a gazillion awesome things that we can't even possibly think about right now to solve these problems. So we wanna enable humans writ large, the ability to develop applications that benefit humanity in ways that are very measurable and quantifiable. And that's Privateer's mission. How do, um, and maybe they don't, but how do the development, you know, we, we've talked on, on some of our shows about some of these, these next generation uh, astro navigate, or astro tools, let's say, things like hypersonics. Um, as the things that we're shooting off uh, get more complex and faster, so how does that impact um, what goes on in, in something like Astrograph, or is it just... It, is astrograph, you know, because it's moving at the, at the speed well, of light anyway. Well, 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 no, so here's the thing, right? I mean, um, this is a great question because, um, I mean, you use the term digital twin. Um, I, I um, 
because that has become jargony now, I try to, I, I'm always, um, you know, I guess try, hesitant to, to, to use that sort of stuff. But I, I think ideally what I'm trying to say is that in trying to develop a digital replica of some domain or some part of the universe or whatever, it's like there's uncertainty involved that needs to be represented and modeled. Um, it's not just the data, but it's like the models of physics involved in these sorts of things that also need to be curated. So, so what needs to be housed in this uh, digital, you know, virtual replica of mm -hmm. sorts are data information, uncertainty with regards to that, the models that we use, the ability to refine those models, the understanding that there's going to be latencies involved, and that six hours later, there may be a piece of evidence that now changes your entire perspective of what actually happened. Like, it's really complicated. It is a significant computational undertaking to dive into this. And we don't have all the answers to how to actually make this stuff work at this point. We have ideas on how it could come together, but basically we're building the airplane in flight. I'm a, um, I'm a huge fan of science fiction, especially space science fiction, but one of my favorite movies you know, sort of tangential to it all is the uh, is the Mel Brooks classic Spaceballs, the parody from 1980, I think 1985 by now. And in that, they have this giant vacuum cleaner that, well, it's stealing oxygen from the planet, but it gets you thinking, right, about, you know, obviously there's a million things up there now and there's going to be more than that. Um, just what, what are you looking at in terms of, you know, whether privateer is ever going to be focused on cleaning some of that stuff up? Uh, and does it have a giant vacuum cleaner somewhere? But w what are we going to be doing about sort of cleaning yeah. things up when the micrometeor has become 5 million of them instead of 1 million at some point? Right. So I think the first step in trying to solve a problem is actually quantifying what the problem is. And I feel that we have ideas of it, but there's still knowledge that needs to be created about uh, an awareness about, you know, what's the population? How is it actually, uh, you know, growing, evolving, that sort of stuff? This is where I uh, invoke, I guess, principles or tenets of uh, indigenous knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, where one of them is empiricism. And I feel that we, we're not empirical enough, meaning we just start making decisions before the system, before nature is able to give us feedback on not just the intended, but unintended consequences yeah. of our interactions with it. And so the first thing that I would probably try to motivate people is say, look, um, we don't know to what extent launching 60 things every three weeks is long-term? Can we just slow down the rate of launch to give us time to see how, how the environment, what feedback the environment gives us on the unintended consequences of our behavior so that we can then make more informed decisions and that sort of stuff. And so regarding the you know, space traffic and debris problem itself, um, all the things that are contributing to the growth of debris we have some ideas about some of them, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have sufficiently accurate or precise predictive models to know, okay, these things we actually don't have to worry about because in 300 years, you know, these natural cycles will cleanse this, will this, that, or the other. Like there's so much uncertainty and um, because it's a complex system, we still, all these causal relationships, we still don't understand them, all the interdependencies. So there's no kidding science that we need to bring to the table uh, holistically um, so that we can figure out, okay, now that we understand how this thing is evolving, here are the decisions that we need to make. Here's how we need to manage this finite resource in order for it to be long-term sustainable. And uh, like I said, in certain pockets of indigenous populations are very, well, uh, very good at this because um, they would not be able to exist, like they would have faced extinction Yep. Had they not figured this out. And the whole reason why we call our app, initial app on privateer Wayfinder is because it comes from the indigenous, uh, general indigenous uh, populations that, that have said wayfinding is your ability to have a successful conversation uh, with the environment uh, because indigenous people have, have needed to do that. And there's a new concept out there called like, re, like rewilding mm -hmm, and the whole mm -hmm. Right, so it's like that's what we need to do with space. We need to be, we need to rewild space in the sense that 
Um, there are natural phenomena and processes occurring and we have to adapt our behavior as much as possible to not only not worsen it, but harmonize with what the natural processes are so that we're not forcing our own rigidity, prejudices and biases in a way that are long-term detrimental to our own existence as a species. No, yeah, it's an excellent message. I've, I've had, I've had uh, members of the uh, Warani tribe from Ecuador uh, on a show last year, and they were talking all about the spirit of the uh, uh, the jungle. And, you know, yeah, you're, you're making yeah. a very interesting... Uh, I'm with you there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like somebody yeah. asked me very recently on a podcast yesterday, oh, so the way you speak, it seems like uh, you're very spiritual. Like, is that at odds with... No, it's... it's it, Look, it's one fabric, man. It's all yep. one thing, you know? Yep. So, yeah. yeah. Um, more about you. You're doing research. You're teaching. You're an entrepreneur now with the company. Uh, you're testifying before Congress. Um, what else is coming up for 2022? Uh, any other uh, you know, places that we can see you, meet you, uh, other things that are happening that you want to mention? Please take the floor, Ed. No, absolutely. So look, I mean, next week, uh, I know this is soon, but next week there's a Space Sustainability Summit in London, okay. uh, June 22nd, 23rd. So I'm, I'm heading out to London here in, in, in a couple of days. I'm going to be giving a talk there. Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to show up. He's going to do a, a, a live uh, show of his Star Talk radio out there. So that's going to be exciting. Awesome. Um, yeah, there's like uh, the Amos Conference, which is a space surveillance conference on Maui every September. I'm going to uh, definitely uh, be out there for that. Um, yeah, and, and certainly at, at kind of major space things, I'm going to be showing up throughout the year. But uh, at the same time, I think people need to keep an eye out that, uh, uh, you know, I'm developing more uh, public public figure, my, my public persona, uh, TV, film, media type stuff is stuff that I'm pushing out as well. So, yeah, um, it'll be hard to miss me. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And, and, and we're honored that, you know, in, in all of that, you had time to stop by and see us. It just, yeah, yeah, of course, man. It's, uh, it, it's, it's an awesome story more, but I, I really just, you know, listening to it. And I said, I've, I've read a lot about, you know, I've watched a lot of presentations and it's just uh, so impressive what you're doing uh, and really wishing you the best with all of this, uh, you and the team. Um, for, for everybody that's going to be listening uh, to this episode across the podcast networks or, or watching on our YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been listening to Dr. Mora Baja, Associate Professor, Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, University of, Testino University of Texas, Austin, also Chief Science Advisor and Co-Founder of Privateer. Uh, Mora Baja, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing to keep space safe and clean and sustainable for us. And as we say on this show, thanks for creating a better tomorrow for everyone everybody through what you're doing. Really very impressive stuff. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. Good seeing you.